Welcome to the SAG After Foundations program. I'm Pete Hammond from Deadline. Uh, now, uh, before we're joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. Uh, this conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. And as you might imagine, over the past year, the foundation has given over $6.5 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. So if you're a SAG after artist and need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Uh, information can be found uh, in the description of this video. And uh, we thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce a true veteran and a star in the casting community. No question about it. You probably all know her uh, one way or another. Uh, Vicki Thomas. Uh, hi, Vicki. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Um, we're going to talk about your uh, most recent project, or one of them. I, I, hate, I hate to say most recent. You've probably done 20 things since then, too. <laughs> but uh, obviously, the Mosquito Coast. But when you look at your uh, credits, and they are just voluminous uh, here, it's amazing. And you won the Emmy. So congratulations. You won the Emmy, yeah. uh, uh, most yeah. recent Emmys, uh, uh, for uh, Watchmen. And uh, you've had uh, three nominations for Emmys, 13 nominations for Artius Awards uh, from the Casting uh, Society and uh, winner of four there for a Black Lady Sketch Show. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, my favorite movie of that year. I was number one on my list. Of, um, just, I think it was an incredible film. Hidden Figures, another great movie, straight out of Compton. You've won numerous awards from many organizations worked in movies, television, so many credits here. I'll go over a few of them uh, with you, but welcome uh, to you. our conversation here. Um, when I talk about all that, how does that make you feel? I mean, you, you have old. been in this business a long time. <laughs> old? <laughs> not really, I do not feel old, I take that back. But it is, it's a lot of stuff, so. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I kind of don't think about it. And then when you kind of look at all of it, it it's a little overwhelming. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, I, I'm always curious, and people are always curious how you get started in this business. And I know you went to, uh, I think, University of San Diego in San Diego. I went to UC San Diego for undergraduate, and I was a communications major. And then I went to UCLA uh, for gradu uh, the graduate film school. And uh, just kind of. You're got a native. You're a native LA like me. You're, you're from here. I'm a proud Angelino. Me too. Yeah. Born in Santa Monica. Don't put down LA. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've never left either. Um, so how do you go from, from that uh, in, into this uh, field, casting? Just realized in, in film school, I, uh, one of my fellow students, you know, film students asked me to cast their thesis film. And um, I went, sure. <laughs> you know, we all worked on each other's movies. And um you know, we started casting it and his thesis film became a low budget feature film called Repo Man through the many sort of, uh, 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 just by, by happenstance, many, many circumstances. And they kept me on to cast it when it became an actual real movie, <laughs> which I was shocked <laughs> at. And um, yeah, I guess I was good at it and it was kind of started something that led to me still being here all these many years later. Yeah, well, casting requires great knowledge of the acting community and actors and things. So when you start, you probably don't have, obviously you've got so much knowledge of it now, but how do you build that? How do you, how do you develop Just, that? I looked at a lot of TV and movies when I was growing up. And I looked, we looked at a lot of movies at UCSD with my professor, Manny Farber. So I got a real big film education from him. But even before then, as a young girl, I looked at a lot of television. I was, I had my TV scrapbooks and my favorite actors and my favorite TV shows and just looked at a lot of movies and was always uh, interested in the actors and remembered the actors, knew the actors. So I guess maybe something was kind of set in place uh, a long time ago. Yeah. Wow. So you just had that kind of innate knowledge uh, from from watching TV. A lot of people just watch TV and forget about it. You know, who is that person or whatever? You know, you're going to have to know those little names on those credits when that comes oh, I yeah, you know, I, I knew them and I liked them. I liked seeing seeing them do, you know, different shows and different movies. So I was very much aware 
of who I liked and who affected me um, emotionally. And uh, so, yeah, I guess it was something was kind of, you know, cast at that, so to speak, um, at an early age for me. When you started, that was around, uh, I think Repo Man was around 1984. You've been at this about yeah. four decades. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The business has changed. It changes daily, it seems yeah. like right now, the, yeah. whole, the whole thing. When you started, as opposed to now, what was what was the big difference? Were there many casting directors of color, or, or was it uh, you know? Uh, I, I think when I started, Ruben Cannon was uh, probably the biggest casting director of color, and there, there are a few others, yeah. Uh, but he was probably the biggest one. He did a lot of television and kind of the, the most well known, I, I would say. But yeah. I think the numbers there aren't the same numbers of casting directors that there are now. Um, you kind of felt like it was a smaller community then. And today, maybe it's just because of all the, the new content. There's a lot more casting directors, you know. But before then, it smelled. It felt like a like a just kind of a small community of us. Yeah. So more jobs. <laughs> yeah, more jobs, and also it's like, okay, well, I didn't get that, but so and so got it. That's great. And you know, maybe I'll. I don't think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna take off three months, and I'll come back and do something that. You know, it's kind of a. You could kind of take time off and come back and do something because there always seemed to be plenty of work for people. I remember Ellen Chenoweth saying that to me. We were kind of talking about those days and she's saying, yeah, they just used to seem, always seem to be, you know, work for everybody. Yeah. You know, I mentioned uh, the Emmy nominations, different awards. One place that doesn't have it is, are the Oscars. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically now, David Rubin is a casting director who is also the president of the Academy. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think they don't have, I mean, I was on the board of governors of the television Academy for six years. I, I served with casting directors, everybody. We have it. All these people have it. Why, why does the motion picture Academy, even with David Rubin up there still have a hard time getting that through? I think it's kind of uh, educating people as to what our contribution really is and that our contribution is just as important as a, a costumer, a makeup person, a DP, a, you know, a, anybody else who, get, who gets nominated for an Oscar. And I, th I, think, I think there was an old guard there for a while who uh, thought, the, thought of the director as kind of director, the director of all things. And, and a casting director is more kind of like the casting lady or the, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the pictures to him. And um, so I think there's a little bit of reticence in the old days, when we, when we first started doing, started to get a, trying to get Oscars for us, I should, I say old days, I should take, put that a different way. But back in like the 70s, not the 70s, back in the 80s and 90s, specifically the 90s, we tried to uh, get this going. And there are several, a couple of failed attempts with Mike Fenton, you know, on our yeah. side. And just, yeah. I think there was a, a reticence with an old guard. You know, I just think they didn't see our contribution as, as, as important as, as, as we thought it was. And, and that it was all the director. Yeah, well, that, you know, you are called casting directors, and I guess that became a whole thing with the DGA. I remember yes, Taylor, exactly. Hackford. Taylor Hackford exactly. was a problem there as well, I noticed. So as, uh, I, I noticed Taylor Hackford was against it. I mean, directors who feel yeah. like that director title, um, I yeah. guess, was the real roadblock. Yeah. Well, hopefully now, maybe, is there talk that uh, it's going to come up again, especially with David Rubin leading it? Yeah, I mean, I think we're trying to figure out the right timing and <laughs> you know, he has to represent the entirety of the of the Academy. And, you know, we're just hope, we're hoping that by, edu you know, making ourselves known and having our presence uh, at, you know, kind of on committees, on, on at functions that they'll start to kind of see us as uh, in, in, in the light that we, we think we deserve to be seen that you do deserve to be seen. What people don't understand, I say this about sound designers, they don't understand what sound does. I don't think they understand a whole lot of what casting directors do. You know, yeah. it's been misunderstood. And, uh, and you're right when you say directors want to take the credit uh, in article after article, I read, when I cast this person, when I did this, they, it sort of morphs into they did it, but it's you guys uh, that start that process. No question. I mean, it's, it's a collaboration. I don't want to take anything away from, no. from directors because obviously in the end, we, you know, we're trying to 
fulfill their, their vision. And, uh, you know, so it's not like I'm trying to say that they don't do anything or anything. They, they do a <laughs> lot, but, but so do we. Yeah. What is your process, though, when you get a project, uh, say, let's talk about the Mosquito Coast here, which, by the way, just today, just this morning, I wake up and here it is on deadline, my site and everybody else. It's been renewed. Oh, uh, for a, I, tell me that. <laughs> breaking news here as we tape this. Wow. Breaking news. Uh, Mosquito Coast has been renewed for another okay. season. <laughs> thank you thank you for thank you for telling me that <laughs> with apple so you've got uh, you know more to look forward there but um talk yeah. about when you go into a television series you've done so many of them uh, insecure obviously the morning show for apple as well and so many others uh black lady sketch show Take, take this as an example here of what you look for when you're casting a, a series uh, and going in and what that process is for you. Well, I mean, it's similar to when you cast a movie. I mean, you kind of start out with certain ideas you might have. You kind of make a list for you know, producers in the studio, kind of see where they're coming from in terms of what they want to get out of casting a lead or a couple leads. And they may be going for some name value or you may be allowed to cast an unknown. So just... That, that, that can affect how you first start a project, um, whether you're dealing lists and trying to see who you want to make a, an offer to, or whether you can open it up and put out a breakdown and try to you know, find a, a, a new, uh, to, just to discover someone. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar. I mean, it's really talking amongst producers, studio, figuring out what you're all going for, uh, making that list or putting that breakdown out, uh, talking about you know, the characters and, just motivations and, you know, who these people are. And, and so in that sense, that's the creative conversation I kind of like to have. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's not that much different from a, from a movie really, you know? I think there, there seem to be a few more voices in the room on, in television than I was used to in, in film. So that's something you gotta, you gotta get used to. And I think it, 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 it's different whether it's a cable show versus a network show. Working for HBO is a little less maybe intrusive than it might be working for like an ABC or an NBC. You know, it just, just it depends. It just, you know, kind of depends on also who controls the show. You know, they don't, you know, if it's Issa Rae, they kind of defer to her, but also they collaborate. But, you know, some people have a, a vision and some people have a certain amount of power. Um, so that could affect how much the studio sort of interferes with the casting process. <laughs> How does like, you worked with Justin Thoreau before uh, on The Leftovers yeah. and uh, on On the Basis of Sex, I think uh, yeah. was another a credit that you yeah. share. Um, how did that collaboration go? How did, was he attached to it when you came in or? No, no one was attached to Mosquito Coast. The only people on Mos Mosquito Coast were Neil Cross, our writer, showrunner, me, Dante DiLoretto, and Andrew Hazopoulos, my, my associate. We started at the very beginning in 2019. Wow, okay. Yeah, it was a while. So we didn't have anybody attached at all. And we're kind of going for, because it was one of Apple's first forays into all of this, you know, trying to make a big splash and kind of going sort of with more towards the, the movie stars, you know? who right. for whatever reason, whether they felt they'd done something like this before or they were busy or whatever, it didn't happen with them. So we were able to open it up a little bit um, beyond that kind of initial five or six names that you, you know, that, that a studio wants to, wants to go after. And, you know, Justin was just a really good actor who obviously can do the part. I mean, he's, um, you know, he's related to Paul Thoreau, obviously that right. had nothing to do with our, selection of him it was kind of you know it was a nice uh what do you call that um it was kind of a symmetry there was yeah kind of a, a nice <laughs> symmetry in in the end it really was so it kind of made sense it was, it, that felt kind of satisfying that's wild because most people when they see paul thoreau's name on there they just assume oh well that's how justin got in this no, <laughs> no not at all. he didn't lean on his relatives he did not <laughs> <laughs> so did you think of others before him or did he just yeah kind of like, you know in the, in the process of what you do you kind of go okay we can go this way with this person that way with that person 
and yeah, we, we talked about a, a lot of people. We talked about a, a lot of actors and uh, I'm just glad that it, it eventually came down you know, to Justin. Does it help with this vast filmography that you have, that you have these relationships uh, previous with so many people that you may have worked with, or maybe you saw for another role in something else, but you remembered them? Is, is there a lot of that? Because we had a lot of actors watching this today that want to <laughs> know, how do I get to Vicki Thomas's uh, office and get in front of her? Well, I mean, look, it's... Uh... Yeah, look, what I'll say to actors is even once you get in, you do an audition or whatever, if, if you're not right for this, you might be right for something else. And I'll, I think most ca casting directors kind of keep you in mind. So just because, you, just because you didn't get this job doesn't mean that they're not, they're not thinking about you for another job. So, and, and you know, also we see people, you know, at the beginning of their careers, we see them over the course of their careers kind of get better mature as people become better actors you know it's just it's an interesting process to see people at the beginning and watch them grow and uh it's kind of a satisfying process and um, i don't know you just have to do do the work come in do a good audition prepare and like i said hopefully make an impression of some kind even if it's not for that particular job. It could be for something else. Auditions are so hard. Is there like one audition that you remember just like watching this actor and go like, wow, this uh -huh. is a, a superstar in the making or something that just knocked it out of the park or? Yeah, I guess there are different versions. Yeah, d different examples. Uh, hmm. I remember when Vigo came in and read for uh, Crimson Tide. Yeah. And uh, he did a scene and, uh, with Tony Scott. And he did it once and it, uh, kind of an emotional scene and uh, read it once, it was fine, it was okay. But you know, Tony wanted to dig a little bit deeper. You could tell Vigo was trying to find something. And he came back and did a second take of the audition that uh, where he kind of broke through emotionally in in the scene, and it really caused all of us to like, kind of <laughs> literally all went, kind of step back because something in, in the second or third take of the audition really took. And, and it was a really a burst of some sort of emotion that even in the audition room, it was kind of Kind of, wow. kind of took took your breath away. So That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've seen the uh, clip of uh, Henry Thomas auditioning for E.T. Oh, and yeah. a very famous kind of audition thing, and uh, he just like wow. Yeah. I yeah. mean, uh, it, it was like it was a take for the movie, not an audition. And you hear, um, I think it was Spielberg saying, yeah. you know, you 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 just booked the job, kid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right there. It was just yeah. so apparent. Uh, yeah, I think all casting directors have their examples, you know, of, of that. I mean, when Chad, Chadwick Boseman came in on 42, it was like the second guy in the room. It's like, oh, <laughs> I think it's him. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> then. <Wow. laughs> what was it about Chadwick Boseman that you just knew this is Jackie Robinson here? I don't know. Uh, God, how do you put that? God, I you know I don't know how you put that into 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 words really. Yeah. Um, I think it was the that was a chance we got to cast an unknown. We weren't beholden to casting a name. And look, he was always a good actor. And when he came in, you know, sometimes timing. It's like, you know, you've read I've read Chad before, so have lots of other casting directors. I'm sure lots of other casting directors have wanted to cast him. But sometimes it's the right role, the right time. It's just just everything, it's just timing. And yeah. I think that's what it was with Chad. Let me get back to Mosquito Coast on the other key actors here. You had four roles, the family, that are so important and they have to be believable together and work together, which has always got to be a consideration when you're casting something like like that. Yeah, we kind of, that was, we wanted to, that family, yes, the casting of the family was very important because you're with them, you know, all all the time you want them to, feel like a real family. Um, you want them to all be, have distinct personalities, but 
actually kind of share a similar DNA and, um, and just have, have them be unique people in the way that their mother and father are with, the, with those two kids. So just trying to cast a unique and singular young actors for the kids and, and, uh, and you know, a wife and mother that uh, you, you see why she's with a husband who, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an extreme lifestyle, you know, um, extreme circumstances they, they find themselves in. So yeah, I think the cast of the family was really crucial and important and we did it somehow and just tried to make them seem like a family unit. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the wife as, as Margo, um, I had heard uh, Melissa George uh, was asked to provide a tape and didn't. Yes. <laughs> Actors out there are going like, what? <laughs> no, you know, it's funny. I think she thought, oh, I'm not going to get this. And <laughs> I, Why I think bother? that was thinking, you know, and it was like, yeah, we asked her tape early, early on. And then you check back in. Is she going to do that? Yeah, yeah, she's going to do it. OK. And I'm sure people get busy with their lives. And then you think, oh, they've probably cast it by now if I haven't taped by this date. And finally, as we were getting down to it, you know, Justin mentioned her and I said, we've asked her to tape before. And I said, I think he called her and said, get yourself on tape. <laughs> and um, she did it and she got the job. See, that is an amazing kind of uh, story there. I mean, somebody who just has a, an attitude or something that they just don't think they're going to get it. But here's the thing. You do it even at that point and you got the role, you got, you got the job. Yeah. And we, we you know, we, we look at stuff. We, I mean, you're not taping and even if you don't hear back, we looked at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you do, you go through all of this. And, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, we want to get it over with. We want to cast it and, you know, move on, to, move on to the next. <laughs> <laughs> what about the kids in casting, you know, kid, I've seen Gabriel Bateman in many things, yeah. um, yeah. Uh, you know, so sometimes when you have a young actor that is as exposed as he is, you wonder, well, maybe it's better to go with somebody you don't know at all. Or what was the idea in casting Gabriel Bateman, for instance? Well, he, he's gifted. He, he's good. He's done a lot of work, but he's still, he's not like, you know, he's not a, like a, a Disney kid. He's not, yeah. <laughs> he, he's still nothing against Disney. There's great kids on Disney, but he is still, after all that work, kind of pure and kind of uh, not repeating what he's done before and, you know, interesting. And so, I mean, his, his experience for us, I think was, was a plus and he's an experienced kid who's still able to uh, be fresh. Yeah, that's and interesting. And with Logan, it was just, she's just like, she's just a unique girl. I mean, I, I worked with Logan when she was a little girl. I worked with the Polish brothers on a movie we did called Astronaut Farmer. And oh. Logan was in that playing one of Billy Bob and Virginia Madsen's kids. So I hadn't seen Logan since she was <laughs> one or two or the whatever, however old, three years old or something like that. So wow. it was really great to kind of have that come back around and see her as a young, a young woman and uh, to cast <laughs> her. And she, she's interesting. They're just trying to cast interesting people, unique people, people you take an interest in when you watch them on screen. She's very interesting. You can tell from the first episode, just like she's got whatever it is you need yeah. to get. She's got yeah. Um, yeah. no question about it. And it makes them an interesting thing that is the reason why it's gotten renewed now and, and why, you know, you want to keep watching them yes. as you go along. Was it intended, though? as a limited series was it ever thought of that it was was going to go on um for several seasons i mean i think they all have the hope you, you know i mean you start and you so we'll, we'll see where this goes and then i think you sort of have a, the neil cross i'm sure had a bible for if it goes past year one and what happens in year two and so yeah i think with all those limited series like that. I guess you hope that there there are legs to it, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. Speaking of an Apple, the other Apple show that you've worked on, and I know Mimi Leader, you worked with her yeah. on On the Basis of Sex. She's so fantastic. Yeah. And uh, to come into that is a different situation than Mosquito Coast because you've got these two star, big producer stars of the show, Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon, 
right out there uh, in front. So what was that experience like coming on to that show? Well, I mean, uh, you know, you want to, whatever you, uh, first of all, it was great because I know Mimi and everybody on the show is great. I mean, Reese and Jen are active producers and they're great people and great taste. Um, and you just know that whenever you cast anyone that's going to be in a scene with them, you really got to like, they have to be able to play with those two girls. <laughs> and, you know, Jen is so comedically gifted too, that she needs somebody she can, depending on the character, that she can kind of go back and, and, and forth with. So it puts pressure on the casting process, on, on <laughs> casting, just yeah. so that you really have to, you better, <laughs> you better be able to do something or act or be able to improv or whatever it is with those two ladies. Yeah. And, and the rest of the cast too. You put somebody in the scene with Billy Crudup. I mean, you, you know, you got to put somebody up there who and can Steve play with Car it. Steve Carell playing against type, if there is a tie. I think he's like Jack yeah. Lemon to me. He can play yeah. drama and, you know, right. I yeah. mean, he's just one of those actors that can do that. Yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good comparison, actually. That's a good <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and so he's great. They're, I mean, that show is, yeah, that's just a show loaded with, you know, fantastic people. And uh, yeah, you just try to cast the best that you can. Of all the jobs you've done, is there one you can look at that was just like, wow, this is, I can't find anybody. I just, you know, I, I, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, no, there, yes. Really? <laughs> yeah, I think every casting director is like, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to cast. Yeah, now I'm trying, <laughs> trying to think specifically because, wow. Uh, I mean, look, eventually, you know, somebody's on the, sh on the set day one, so you, you cast it. But yeah, there are times when you just, it's very, very frustrating. You can't quite get at something. And then, look, the casting of Margot took a long time. Yeah. In Vito Coast. So when Melissa finally did her tape, it was like, oh my, thank God. You know, <laughs> somebody everybody could agree on and she was good. And okay, that works. And she and Justin, it's like, oh, it's, she could be their mom. Yeah, that, that all worked. And so, yeah, kind of, that, that was a happy ending. Um, but yeah, it can be, Frustrating. I, I can imagine. And maybe I'm going to ask you about some directors that you've worked with, because I'm curious about the processes. And I know casting directors forge a relationship with mm -hmm. directors where you come back movie after movie. You can work with them. I noticed earlier in your career, and I love this picture, Bullworth, yeah. uh, Warren Beatty. Yeah. Uh, who I, I think he's a great guy. I've interviewed him for several hours, as you might expect. But <laughs> he, yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. he, yeah, he likes to think about things. Um, what was that like? Because you are also listed as a co-producer on yeah. that movie as well. How did that happen? How did that come um, about? <laughs> you know, he wanted my input, and um, it was an opportunity I had to step into those shoes, which is what I wanted to do anyway, in terms of the co-producing. And uh, yeah, we, um, we met, I think we met, he hired somebody else, then he came back and I did it. And it was just amazing working with someone who straddled an old studio system you know, up until like, I think we did that in 97 or something like that. Yeah, right. Some who's worked with Ilya Kazan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, what are you talking, he's like, Ilya Kazan's like my favorite, you know, director. He did Splendor in the Grass. I remember seeing that as a kid and loving that movie. So someone with that wealth of knowledge uh, and who's that great a filmmaker, whether it's Reds, you know, Heaven Can Wait, I mean, that was a that was a monumental experience for me working with Warren. That really kind of gave me a confidence. It gave me a confidence uh, that I didn't quite have before to be able to be in a room with somebody like that. You know, me, yeah. you know, 1464 West 37th Street, Los Angeles 90018. You know, in a room <laughs> with, you know, like Warren Beatty. I mean, it really, it, it gave me a, a confidence that I could, you know, engage and be creative with him. What was he like to work with? I, I'm curious about his process. Oh, fantastic and maddening at the same time. Yeah. You know, he's like, he's great. You know, he has very high standards. Um, you, you work late um, and he's just very creative. He's, he, 
you know, he can, he can test you a little bit. <clears throat> so you have to always be on your toes and know every aspect of a production he asks you about, or who, you know, you'll say, suggest an actor, you know, so and so. Well, what, what, what's he working on? Well, Warren, he's working on this. Where are they shooting? Well, they're shooting, you know, hmm. who wrote it? Uh, I think it was written by, yeah, who's directing? <laughs> you know, your paces, you know, and, and once I didn't have the answer quite quick enough for him, and he just looked up, up at me. <laughs> really? You don't have the answer to that? But he's fun. He's fun. He's, he's I love him. He, he's, he's great. He's That's great. so cool. Well, let me ask you about some of the other directors, including Rupert Wyatt, who I think, uh, you know, yeah. is a terrific director, the uh, yeah. Planet of the Apes movies and different things. And here he's working on a series. Uh, yeah. What was that collaboration like? Really good, because Rupert, uh, he doesn't want to settle for anything obvious. Um, he's, he's very creative, wants to be creative in the casting, not give people what they think they want. Um, very hands-on with the casting and just creatively very interesting. And I think we're on the same wavelength as to, especially with the kids and what sort of kids that we wanted. Didn't want, we just wanted kids who felt like real kids and uh, didn't feel like they were acting necessarily um, or acting like kids. Um, so we got along really, really well. And just creatively, I think we, we, we clicked. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I have to ask you about Quentin Tarantino because he is famous for bringing actors, knows every actor, you know, from every movie that he saw, from working in a video store and uh, everywhere else and has brought so many back, you know, and given them their second career, as it were, Robert Forster, many others that I can name too. What was he like to, and you worked with him, not just on, the brilliant Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but the brilliant Django, Django Unchained and Hateful Eight. Uh, what was that like? It's it's really fun. I mean, it's <laughs> very much him and me in a room with an actor, and you know, we're all, we'll read a scene. He says, "Well, I'm going to play this part. Okay, you play that part. Okay, all right, here we go." And we start reading with the actors. It's very around a couch, very <laughs> intimate. You know, it's very low key. He likes actors. He knows their credits. He knows their beginning TV credits and they're shocked when he can name their episode of NCIS that he saw them in. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just great. I mean, there's not, he's, first of all, to, and to read his writing when you're auditioning actors, it's like, I mean, what a, I mean, what's wrong with his writing? I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. So we have, we have a really good relationship. We bond over the fact that we know obscure actors from the past. And uh, I think we kind of had a, I think we kind of had a similar childhood just in different parts of LA, just, you know, kind of looking at TV, similar TV shows, you know, me in LA and him and, in, in uh, was it not, not in Torrance, he was in, uh, where was Quinn? Well, he he worked in a. Uh, I live in Manhattan Beach, and he actually worked in a uh, video store. The famous uh, video store he worked in was is right here. We used to be it's a yeah. bagel store now, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he was in the South Bay here, and I think he grew up though in Alhambra or somewhere like that. Something like that, some, somewhere yeah. there. But yeah, uh, yeah, he's. I mean, working with him is fantastic. Well, you have to be really good as you were sort of like self-effacing there, but to be in a room with him and be in that job, you have to be top of the line, I think. Well, thank, thank you. I mean, he's, yeah. uh, he does his own little test. He'll mention like an obscure actor from something. Just, <laughs> just see if I catch it. Uh, you know, just, he just does that. <laughs> That's so, so fun. Yeah, yeah, that's um, cool. Let me name some others. Damon Lindelof. Uh, you won an Emmy for uh, Watchmen and, of course, um, uh, Leftovers and different shows you've done. He's pretty brilliant. I mean, Damon is a pleasure to work with and just creatively brilliant and uh, thought-provoking and progressive. Um and just a pleasure to work with. Uh, and every, everything has been, well, I've done two things with him. I mean, it's just been very unique. And um, it's just very easy 
very easy working with him. He doesn't make it hard. He doesn't, he, yeah, it's just, he likes to have a, you know, just let's, let's not worry too much about that. Who can, let's get the right person. And okay, we'll go for that. He's just very accommodating as long as, you know, you kind of fulfill the vision of, of the character, but he's, he doesn't, doesn't stress too much. He, he's, it's, I really enjoyed both those experiences working with him. They're really, really special. He's special. And Watchmen produced uh, an Emmy win for you. Do you, do you go and think of, well, this is the one I'm, they're finally going to recognize me here and I'm going to win. Um, and also the actors won on that too. So, you know, that was what made that such a special um, show. In, in, to, to I think produce. subject matter. I, I think subject matter, um, especially given yesterday was the 100th anniversary of Black Wall Street, I guess yeah. people call it. And yeah, so it was special in, in that regard. And also just, you know, look, getting, being able to, Yaya, you know, yeah, yeah, getting up to cast him and you know, Regina doing her thing and uh, just Don Johnson and, and to be able to cast Lou Gossett. I mean, come on. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? So it was just a very special project just because of timing when it was done, what the storyline was and, uh, and working with Damon and all the people that he, the talented people he uh, assembles. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I noticed you've worked uh, you, you, in, in a couple of instances with different directors like Ed Zwick, who I, I love Ed Zwick. And yeah. you did Trial by Fire, which is a movie that went to Telluride. And, and it was exciting to see without knowing anything about it. And and then his previous film, Early On, Last Samurai and things. How do you yeah. establish a relationship that goes on for decades, really, here with different things? I was yeah, you know, um, we met. Um, he was getting ready to do Last Samurai. He met him. He had to make a decision quickly. We sat down. We talked. And five minutes, ten minutes, he said, you want to do it? I was like, sure. Sure, I'll do it. <laughs> You know, uh, but he's kind of like my brother in a way. We're kind of like battling brother and sister. <laughs> uh, but he's, I mean, he's great. A great writer. Um, a great socially conscious uh, director. A socially, socially conscious human being. And just easy to work with. We have fun together. And, you know, I'm just, I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate to work, to work with him. What about Denzel? Denzel, he doesn't look at tapes when I ask him to look at tapes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's great. He's just, he's, he's, <laughs> I get mad at him. Look at that tape. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, he, he's, he, he's great. And he's just, you know, look, he's an actor. So he is very uh, opinionated, obviously, about actors. And, um, has definite likes and dislikes, and uh, but also loves you know working with good actors. So and he's very generous to them, and um, so I've uh, I, we, we have a good time together too when I'm not scolding him for not looking at tips. <laughs> you know, uh, you did uh, Amistad with uh, Steven Spielberg. Uh, you know, uh, King of Hollywood, as it were. People would call yeah. him, and you know, what was that like? That was earlier on in my career. It was kind of uh, intimidating. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're going into work with Spielberg and it's like, again, I mean, it was, just, it was intimidating, but he very nice, or tr truly, truly nice man. And uh, it was a big subject matter, you know, it's about the slave ship on So it was a uh, important subject matter. And um, it's just, yeah, you just have to get used to the idea that you're working with the Steven Spielberg and try to just do your <laughs> job, yeah. you know, and not get flustered. Um, but that was great working with him. That was, mm -hmm. that was really, I think it was one of, it was Matt McConaughey's big, I think kind of more kind of Hollywood leading role, you know, yeah. he had done much uh, before then. And uh, it was a great uh, challenge to get all the, all the, um, the African uh, actors, you know, whether it's yeah. Jaiman or Chiwetel, I think it was Chiwetel's first movie. Um, so it was, Great just to kind of discover, along with uh, we are our London casting director too, just to discover those those guys. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I, before we go, I want to talk about the changes in, in the business directly. Uh, now, there is a big move, bigger than in the past, certainly, uh, for diversity 
Uh, do you notice that, that the industry may be changing in that way and, in, and to colorblind casting? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's happened. I think, I think television's led the way more than movies. I think in the last, I guess, 10 years, seven years, something like that. There's definitely, especially in the last five years, there's definitely been a push to where you're now kind of being told by the producing entities, by the studios, you know, they're, they're, they're leading the charge for um, just, you know, diverse casting. And before it might've been, you know, you or another casting director going, well, oh, well, what if this part was this? Or, you know, and you're kind of swimming a little, a little bit more against the tide 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but now uh, the producing entities are kind of leading the charge. And, uh, you know, I think that's it. I think overall, I mean, it's, it's really good to try to have shows reflect the world. You know, I think that's a, that, that's a good thing, you know. Actors like Anthony Quinn and Marlon Brando could play an Asian in, in yeah. Tea House of the August Moon and yeah. nobody said anything. And now it seems like it would be an impossible thing for an actor to be cast in a role like that, for instance, or like uh, that that's not of that ethnicity. It's tough, you know, because you look, you go, well, wow, boy, I really did love Al Pacino and Scarface. Right. <laughs> you know, and you go, wow, I really love the accent, everything. And he made, you know, I really believe him as Tony Montana. And, you know, it's like you kind of go, well, obviously, yes, you want opportunities for, you know, actual, you know, whether somebody's Asian or Latino or whatever, to play a part that's written as, you know. Right. Uh, that's written, you know, Latino or Asian or whatever it is. Um, but it's funny, you know, it's like, yeah, but that means Al Pacino wouldn't have been Tony Montana. Huh. <laughs> I think about that. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's, yeah, uh, I do totally you can't do it anymore. Yeah, no, and they're planning on remaking Scarface. Not that I'd recommend that, but I mean, it's, you know, I mean, how do you top sort of that, you know, because you, any actor, that would come in, you know, try to get an actor to play Scarface, which was a remake in and of itself with Paul Muni, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you think, oh, how can I be Paul Muni? But yeah. then Al Pacino, you know, and they go like, I I'm just going to be constantly compared to that performance. Yeah. It's, it's then, uh, then you just have to make it your own. You have to, yeah, it's a new day and you just have to, okay, let's make it as iconic as we possibly can with a Latino, with a Latino action actor actually playing this yeah. Latin here. And that, that's the way it'll go. Uh, in terms of technology, how has your job been made easier now with, with technology? Well, you don't spend hours going through actual hard copies of <laughs> resumes and pictures. You yeah. don't, you know, actors don't stop by the office to pick up the sides or the scripts. <laughs> and it was always kind of nice to see them, you know, and, but <laughs> they, you know, that now it's sent electronically and you're, you're casting from a breakdown, an electronic breakdown and, I used to love kind of going through pictures and resumes, and but it was time consuming. It was very time consuming. And this, it actually, this, uh, all the electronic stuff makes it, you can do a lot more faster, mm -hmm. even though we were all kind of used to the slower way of doing things, but that's just, there are advantages to it too, you know, so. Yeah, there are, you know, I, I used to work, I started in research and I, a researcher I worked with, you know, we were getting all things starting with the internet and things, but she just wanted the paper, the piece, show me the piece of paper. And I'll never forget this. Every piece of paper has its own personality. And, and you know, you get something from holding that and yeah. you don't have that as much now, huh? No, don't yeah. have it as much. Yeah. So yeah. That's the, the way of the world. Uh, a, a, a new world, but uh, one that you've uh, traversed uh, brilliantly through many uh, years and decades of, of doing this. And uh, I just look at your resume, uh, your filmography and all that. And I go, wow, you know, <laughs> what a fun, what a fun life. What a fun career to, to have. I'm very fortunate. Very fortunate. <laughs> and on IMDb, it goes like in the upcoming, you know, you got like 10 projects and things and always, always going. Always if, going. If, huh? if it's true, sometimes I look at that stuff and I go, I'm doing that. I have no idea. <laughs> so, I haven't even looked at it. So I don't know what those 10 projects are. Uh, yeah. Well, always look forward to it. Mosquito Coast, uh, coming back. I'm happy to break that news to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and best of luck in the future. And thank you so much for joining us uh, for the conversation here with the SAG After Foundation. Thank you so much, Vicki. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate it.